people were performing the sacrifices that the people were bringing. And in 1 Samuel 2 and 3, we read that people used to bring their sacrifices. And the people knew that they should burn the fat first. Burn the fat first. Because the fat was God's portion of the offering. All the fat must be burned as a burnt offering of sweet smelling savour to the Lord. Burn the fat first. The meat that Othni and Phineas and the priesthood of the old covenant, the meat must be boiled. It was only the Passover sacrifice that was eaten roasted. But Othni and Phineas didn't want boiled meat. And they began to violate God's specific commands regarding the sacrifice. They didn't want meat for boiling. They wanted meat for roasting. Roasting. And an unknown man, a man who heard the word of the Lord in those days, for there was a famine, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Is just as rare today. An unknown man came to Eli and told him, Why do you honor your sons more than me? Read it yourself. I can't go through it because of time, but read it yourself. And the man said, Why do you make yourself fat on the offerings of God's people? Make yourself fat on the offerings of God's people. Why do men today, why do men make themselves fat on the offerings of God's people, if not in body, certainly in the mind? And I heard one man preach, run from those who are only interested in what you've got in your wallet. It's the norm today. It's become the norm. And some of these men fly around the skies in gold-plated personal jets. things no it is preparation time a cleansing is going to take place and I'm coming to a close a cleansing is going to take place where these people are going to be no more no more making themselves fat on the offerings of God's people. I tell you, the refiner's fire is coming. It's coming. It is coming. I preached that Lincoln prison one time. And this is my closing words. <clears throat> and I faced about 300 prisoners, all in their blue striped shirts. And I began to preach to them. And this is how I approached my preaching 
dark morning. Like a little, I thought I could pattern myself on the pattern of Billy Graham. And this is how I approached my ministry at that prison. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And the Bible says that we can find peace with God through the, the new covenant in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God stopped me speaking. And I began to stammer chronically. I knew I had fought it. And I bowed my head at a lectern. And I repented quite openly before all those men. And I said, Father, forgive me for my presumption, presuming that you would bless my ministry irrespective of my approach to it. You stopped me speaking this morning. Now you've got to do something. This happened in 1970. And while my head was still bowed, and these are my closing words, while my head was still bowed, a silence fell in that prison chapel. Such a silence, not a silence of the graveyard, but a silence that was pregnant with the presence of God. And I began to tingle a little bit in my body. I knew God was there. And one of the prisoners <coughs> got up to his feet, a big man, and he said, Preach to us, man! Preach to us! And I began to talk once again, just like that the man stayed town hall. I began to speak in fluent tones. And that day, prisoners were dropping to their faces on the floor. Even the warders that were lining the aisle of the prison chapel were dropping to the floor. Their, their caps were rolling down because the floor was like that. Their caps were rolling down and warders began to cry on God. About three murderers were brought to Christ that morning, besides many others. But I shall never forget, and I've seen it even since then, the presence of God come down. Lord, grant it. You could do it even this morning, right now. Grant that your presence come down in your beautiful glory, in your beautiful presence. Saturate our hearts. Are you? Now in Jesus' name. Thank you, God.